Well, fantastic. Thanks, Kyler. Um, we'll, we'll start off with an introduction. My name is uh, Adam Cheatham, Director of Strategy and Transformation at Third Stage Consulting Group. Uh, we've been working on these types of transformations for quite some time. So um, really appreciate that you guys are here with us today to, to learn. Uh, this session, we're going to kind of do a Q&A back and forth on planning, managing, and leading your implementation. Um, but we're also aware that there is quite a diverse audience. So as you guys have questions, uh, these sessions are the best when you guys ask questions and we get a chance to kind of talk with you on those. So um, that's a uh, feel free to ask along the way. We'll track those. I also want to also, uh, given that uh, we've got uh, Nigeria and, and Ghana and have, have had some other um, well, well-rounded and diverse attendees. We do have uh, four locations across the globe now. Um, here in the U.S., of course, our headquarters out of Denver, Colorado, um, but our European headquarters is in London, um, and we've got coverage for the whole continent of Europe, as well as um, an office in Brisbane, Australia, um, for for APAC. And we've recently added our third stage Africa out of Cape Town. So we've got a great cross-functional and cross-regional um, coverage for whatever it is your needs might be. And we, we bring a lot of experience to the table from those places. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Adam. So I'm Mitch Otteson, Manager of Strategy Consulting here at Third Stage. Um, I'm really excited about all the growth that we've had at Third Stage, all the international offices that we have. I need to check every one of them off on my list and go visit each one of them because uh, I have not been to all those places yet. So that would be a ton of fun to go be uh, meet my coworkers, but um, really appreciate you all taking the time to, to sit down and talk with us. Like Adam said, it's it's best when this is interactive. Um, love to answer questions. Love to help uh, people as they're as they're considering a transformation or as they're in the middle of one. Kind of navigate what it's like because there's there's a lot of challenges that come up and um, lots of wealth of experience that we can share with you guys. So thank you again for joining us. All right. So. Um... With a, uh, with a quick intro um, on this before we jump into some of the questions that Kyler already has ball, uh, ballparked for us, I want to talk a little bit first about planning, managing, and leading an implementation because all three of these things are different um, and they're all things that we need to consider differently. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then we'll jump into questions for the, some of those questions and then we'll kind of bounce back and forth if that works for everybody. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I think is important on the difference between planning and managing and leading an implementation is that uh, you have to get all three of these things right, and they are different. Planning is creating what it is we are going to do, right? What do we intend to do? And then just as much, how do we structure our intentions in a fashion which is adaptable, right? You know, it's, um, it's, it's not but a matter of days or weeks before your implementation plan. Um, has some changes to it. And that's okay. We just want to plan for them and be ready for them and not be so rigid that we can't accommodate changes that should happen. Um, managing is a part of accommodating and bringing in those changes that should happen, while at the same time, um, making sure that the changes that can't happen don't, and, and foreseeing things like risk and, and battling issues throughout your implementation. This is getting the right people in the right places at the right time, and just logistically having that structure set and the governance around it. Um, we consider leading an implementation as something much different than just managing. Um, you know, you, you've heard the old adage of, you know, there, you know, there are managers and there are leaders and, you know, <laughs> lead, and there's a difference between the two uh, that that still applies to your implementation. Um, and for us, leading a project means not just coming from the executive sponsor level, but a multitude of levels. You have change agents that are associated with your projects. They're leaders. They're leading the conversation on how well this is going. You have your core team who are leaders in the determination of which processes your future will, will look like and those types of things. So um, as we step through these things and have questions, uh, that's kind of the, those are the lenses that we'll approach these, these responses to. But um, as we jump in, you know, I'll, I'll uh, first uh, give Mitch an opportunity to opine on any of those planning, managing, and leading thoughts before uh, we take some of the, the questions from the audience that Kyler has. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, I would say that one of the most important phases of all of this is the, the planning aspect of it. And you can see in the managing and leading um, of a project, if there hasn't been thoughtful consideration put, in into, put into the planning phase, 
uh, it's going to make your diff- your job way more difficult in the managing and leading of the project down down the road. So, uh, tons of emphasis we put on the planning for the project. You can't plan for everything. Something's going to come up, but um, at least stepping through, you know, if if this happens, then this is how we could respond. Um, thinking those things through is one of the most critical things that you can do as you're preparing for a transformation. Very good. Well, let's jump in, if you don't mind, guys, for um, Thomas's question that I was saving here. So just a consideration, we were just talking about how to select the best, best technology for your organization. So a lot of these are about implementation processes and that type of thing. So I saved some for you because I felt as though it um, fit right nicely into that managing tier. So this is a, t- a question from Thomas Wright. Within the SAP world of ERPs, there are a lot of different methods of implementation. In my experience, I have used RDS, Rapid Development Solutions, a few times with good business involvement. My question is whether or not this is something you recommend to customers or not. That's a good question. Um, you know, I would say I'm a big fan of having your technology meet you and your team where you are at or where you plan to be at when your transformation is is done. So having business involvement um, up front is is one of the best approaches that you can have. One of the worst things that can happen is that um, your your implementate your implementation team uh, you know goes into a room behind the curtain and they start working on things and all of a sudden they come back and say, "Look, we're done. Here's your new product." So getting that feedback loop in that deployment methodology uh, is really important. And, and I do like the rapid approach because it, you do get quick feedback. And so you can course correct quickly uh, if you find that, hey, something just didn't meet the mark on what we we're looking for. Uh, and putting that in front of people is the way to make sure that everyone can adopt the system and is comfortable with the functionality. Yeah. And I'd, I'd, um, I'd also add to that those types of rapid deployment strategies and, and um, accelerators, if you will, um, in some cases, those are really effective. I really like them in the in the w- ways that they work. Um, you know, one of the companies that we know very well has a um, a metals accelerator program in their software, and that works really well for uh, for metal manufacturers because it speaks their language. It sets up all of the the units of measure are they're already canned, all of those types of things. So you get a leg up on it. Um, I, what I would say that this is kind of a buyer beware type of, of scenario, though, in that um, some of those rapid deployment things are sold as accelerators that are really just there to charge an upfront flat fee. Um, so as you're evaluating different types of, of um, methodology from different system integrators and different programmers, consider that that rapid deployment method accelerator or, or whatever it is they're calling it um, needs to serve. It needs to be purposefully fit to you. It can't just be a, well, it's the program set up. It's when we install the software. So we're going to charge you enough, another 60 grand up front to do that. Well, the answer is no, that's not how this works. You don't get an extra 60 grand just for showing up to work. Um, you know, the, we, you want to be aware that some of those are buyer's tactics that are made to inflate the price of things. Others really are strong methodologies that are intended to fit either with the software itself or your industry. And you want to make sure that you're vetting them appropriately. Um, That's a good, um, a good oversight. And, and Mitch is coming in and out. He's kind of like, you know, popping it. Maybe he's stuck in the metaverse like I was earlier. So yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to let you read um, Adam Frank's question from London here, because being the business technologist that I am, this is a bit too technical for, for me. So I'm going to let you read it and address it. Okay. And you're talking about the Oracle ERP cloud here, one from Frank. Yes, I sure am. I do want to first give Eric credit for um, cutting straight to the chase on the rapid deployment stuff. You can't change people or processes rapidly. That's a very good point. Um, you know, and as you start thinking through rapid deployment models and the involvement of the business, again, it needs to be aligned towards something that actually enables your software to be deployed effectively. And you still, it doesn't absolve you from the responsibility of making sure that you're managing your processes uh, throughout the uh, this and that you're leading your people through this transformation. 
um, deliberately along the way because rapid deployment models, accelerators, and all that stuff do not change that processes and people are going to to, to change uh, as well, and that can't happen quickly. Um, so for uh, Frank's question here, uh, you know, Eric mentioned monolithic ERP versus best of breed strategy. Does Oracle ERP cloud support best of breed, given that they have bought lots of products like G-Log for transportation and Demontra for advanced planning, EPOS, um, et cetera? Um, the answer is sim uh, simply enough is yes. Um, as I understand it, um, Oracle's ERP cloud is built on their fusion architecture platform that is expected to be uh, able to integrate with multiple things. It's not uncommon that even, even not just specific to Oracle, that some of those more advanced modules like the Demontra uh, demand planning module in Oracle are designed to be, of course, implemented with their core ERP, but are also frequently available as individual programs to be purchased for just that purpose and, and to integrate with other software systems, whether or not they are um, a legacy system or a, a more modern ERP. So um, when you start thinking about best of breed versus uh, versus the monolithic deployment, um, think about it more from a perspective of your particular business needs and how you fit into uh, how a software may resolve those needs for you, as opposed to how do I buy as much Oracle as I can? Did you have any thoughts on that, Mitch? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think that um, you know, looking at your your technology landscape and your environment, and making decisions based on you know what is going to be the best technology to solve for my business needs is better than just going and buying everything that's in within the entire stack. Um, there is some advantage to doing that, but you know, it's it's really having that thoughtful consideration of what's the ripple effect of going and making a decision, um, and and how does that change my other decisions down the road. All great answers, definitely. And I'm just going to pop up back here since this is just such an interactive session. I just want to make sure that we're getting all of the questions. So um, our friend here from Nigeria is asking, what is the first step in a digital transformation journey? And if I could just recommend going back to watch our emerging markets with our head of Africa, Clifford Barton, from day one. And just a logistic reminder, if you go up to where it says schedule, you can click on those recordings and actually access them from the day of. But I just want to make sure we address this one because Adam has helped stand up that that market and um, just make sure we got some um, some feedback on that and keep the questions coming. These are awesome questions, you guys. We will get to all of them. And if we don't within this session, I'll bring some answers back for you. Yeah, and the, the first step in a digital transformation journey is to figure out where do you want to grow? Where do you want to go? What are your growth objectives and how uh, how do you plan to achieve them as a business? Um, you know, with the, the very first step in a digital transformation starts in a non-digital place. Where are we going? What um, what do we want to be when we grow up? I mean, I have a uh, as, as cheesy as that sound, uh, sounds, I have a client that uh, was founded in 1818 and we still talk about what do you want to be when you grow up? It's an important question. So as we start thinking about what are our business objectives? Do we plan to, to grow organically? Do we plan to add new product lines? Do we plan to acquire more people within our industry? All of those growth patterns uh, can influence your digital strategy along the way. And as you start moving towards translating that into a, a, a longer term strategy, the goal is to align technology with your business strategies and objectives in a way that enables them and enhances your competitive advantages in the marketplace as opposed to inhibits them. Um, I always come back to when uh, to organizations that tell me um, IT said we can't do this because the software doesn't work that way. All right. Well, that's a terrible answer. And for those of, uh, of you who are on, on the IT department, I understand that that's the only answer that you can often provide. But from a per business perspective, that's an indicator that maybe you've outgrown your software. Um, Mitch, can you think of any ideas of, of areas where you've seen um, the effectiveness of, uh, of defining a business strategy that aligns with digital strategy up early? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think the flip side is something that we've seen quite a bit of is, you know, someone wants to change for the sake of change and they go through and they implement something that, that goes against their 
core strategy that goes against you know their secret sauce, what makes them competitive in the marketplace, and they just really wanted to um, you know modernize their landscape more than it was to amplify what it is that they do really well. Uh, and so that's why understanding your competitive advantage and building technology to reinforce that or to help to develop that is so critical. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's um, you know, Jerry has a question here as a leader, how do you handle an implementation where the selected software will make things easier for some, but more difficult for others? And that um, part of that, uh, part of the answer to that question is you go back to the strategy, you go back mm -hmm. to the objectives, the, the why are we doing this? Uh, the convert, when you start thinking about a case for change um, and the understanding that this will be harder for others and easier for some, easier for some and harder for others, that's a part of the process. Um, and, you know, while it's unfortunate that it is true that it will get more difficult to, for others, it's not actually as common that it gets more difficult for some. It usually gets easier for everybody after go live. Um, the, the challenge there is as a leader, you come back to that business case and those business objectives and strategy um, and you start thinking about how does that align with technology and then you start explaining to, you you have a case for explaining to people this is the bigger picture and you start to be able to um chip away at that conversation of perceived wins and losses because that's really what you're talking about when you're when people are afraid of going live it's it's the perception of loss uh, what is my role in this organization now that it gets harder? You're going to make this harder for me and I'm going to have to do all the other things that I'm doing today plus this stuff. Um, that's a difficult conversation to confront, but it needs to be talked about in that, yes, there is more stuff that you can and will be doing in the future, but a lot of the stuff you're doing today is um, this redundant manual and ineffective and inefficient is going to go away. So there are also wins and losses on both sides of the table. Yeah. And in, in kind of building off of that, I would say that it's not what happens if this situation comes up, it's when it comes up, because this is a conversation we have with every client, with um, some different person for every transformation, this comes up. So, so definitely this is an area where planning and being prepared for how you handle this is really helpful. Um, I had this conversation yesterday. Someone had basically unlimited purchasing access. Um, through their current system. They could write a $5 million check today, no problem. No one has a second set of eyes on it. No one has uh, has to approve it. It just happens. Um, and they did that to try and speed things up. And to and you know there was a problem with, hey, you're putting red tape in front of me and my processes. I don't like this. Um, and so it was acknowledging that, yes, we are putting the red tape there. Um, we're putting process and procedure there and it's, you know, for you. And it's also for, as your team grows, you can't do all the purchasing yourself. So you need to be able to trust the people on your team to be able to do things within the parameters that uh, you and your leadership agree are, are the right thing to do for the business. Um, and so it's, you know, hearing people out, hearing their concerns, their frustrations, um, and then also helping to guide them to water with saying, Hey, here's why we're doing this. Uh, here's the risk in not doing this as we grow and, and focusing on that future state and, and how this is the best thing for the organization, even though there's some short term pain that, that comes along with it. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree with that, especially as you start thinking about, well, the purpose here isn't to ruin your life. It's to prevent risk to the business. And, and no, we don't want you cutting five million dollar checks unless somebody else has a second eye, set of eyes on it. Those are all good. Um, you know, good boundaries to have and systems can help enforce those things. Uh, question here from Prem Campbell um, about uh, the top causes for IT failures and, and the fact that they haven't changed in 40 plus years. Uh, that's true. Those changes are always going to be there. And I like I like here, Prem, that you um, asked the question, do we need a little bit more focus on mindset, psychological and behavioral issues? Um, I think there's a lot to it th to that. You know, it's, there's a... Um, Executives in particular are put in positions to make big decisions with very little information. And that's generally a, um, an oversimplification of the executive role. But that is one of their responsibilities is to get the right amount of information and make a decision and have the right amount of engagement and make a decision. And in some ways, some people's strengths don't go towards technology. They go more towards business process or the people side of things, um, you know, and helping understand that lean into that from an, an education perspective 
and pulling them in in a way that creates a partnership where you were building a, a relationship with those executives and sharing with them the things that they should be aware of um, educationally is important. Uh, but I do think it will always come down to the idea that business is about taking risks um, and executives are adept at doing that and knowing which risks to take. And they don't just do that with their business. Uh, they do that with their levels of involvement in this, that, and the other, because uh, we all only have so much time. And when you think about um, an executive who may delegate um, responsibilities downwards, a lot of times that sponsorship uh, gets delegated downwards as well. Um, and their level of involvement comes up a level. Um, being able to communicate the, still the support of that executive um, effectively across the organization, I think is an important key uh, aspect to the conversation here, given that if the executive just delegates away their responsibilities as a sponsor, um, that can look really bad as far as an interpretation. You know, we talked about perception a moment ago. Uh, from a leadership perspective, it's okay to delegate those responsi responsibilities, but the next step in leading as opposed to just managing isn't just delegating them away. It's then helping everybody understand who's the leader now. I am still the leader. I have delegated this to this person. They are going to be speaking on my behalf. And I, I am enabling them to lead this and make decisions. That conversation is an important one that in, at the executive level, we don't see that happen very often. So um, I appreciate that question there. Um, Mitch, I'd be curious as to, to your thoughts as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, when we go through these projects, there is a fine line between delegation and disengagement. And so when you see someone who has delegated things, it might have the perception of being disengaged. And so it's that that intentional, that thoughtful communication that says, hey, I am leading this project still and I'm delegating this to this person there, you know, speaking on my behalf. I thought you said that really well, Adam, where, you know, it is thoughtful, it's intentional and it is very clearly communicated rather than I, I don't know, our VP just stopped showing up to these meetings a few months ago. And now I guess this guy's in charge. Um, you know, those questions can really, you know, get in the way of an implementation and a transformation in a way where you, you aren't really sure who's leading it. And, and that's a, a situation you definitely want to avoid. Definitely. And, I, and I, I, I'll go back to the ideas, you know, delegating something away can be perceived as disinterest and in, in lack of involvement. However, um, simply taking the time to communicate effectively as an executive I have delegated this because I have thought through who's the right person for this role and I've given this responsibility to them and they are accountable to me for that. That's a really, really different message um, that helps lean into that perception and provide the support that, yes, as an executive, I am involved in this. I am interested in it and I am invested in the success of it. That's why I put the right person in the right seat. That simple message that is more or less actually what's happening most of the time not communicating it is something that i think is important uh to recognize how those types of gaps can can come up um, yeah, and that really empowers that person who has you know absorbed that task to go and do that role to the best of, of their ability knowing that they have that you know that person's that executive's confidence to go and do the job that they were put there to do it's it's for the that person and the the larger masses as well. It's for both of them. Yep, and I, um, and I like this this comment that that Liam's made in here too. I think it fits fairly well um, in this conversation, which is uh, um, everyone has a God mode because it makes their job easy. Uh, maybe they're seen as a fixer, and by limiting their access, you're threatening the persona they've created. Um, as leaders, through these types of transformations, the way I always see it is we call that a hero culture. Um, and in a, in a lot of organizations, it's, uh, all right, we got problems instead of working um, our normal 40 hours a week, which is actually 50. We're going to work 60 this week, and I'm just going to put my head down, and I'm just going to power through it. And that type of culture is rewarded in a hero culture environment. Um, and that nature of the hero becomes uh, a very visible position. So what we want to do to shift that is to create a, a leadership mentality, which is, we value our heroes uh, so much that we don't want to ruin them. 
Um, so we're going to give them more. Uh, we're going to give them more superpowers by giving them these this greater set of tools. So I, I really like that that thought process there, and and thinking about each individual's role in this as well, because those those failure points that were identified 40 years ago aren't just executives. It's a people culture thing too, and that mm -hmm. mentality of this is the value that I define for myself and that I bring to this organization. I think is really something that needs to be uh, a mindset that's respected by the leaders in your organization as you're implementing a digital transformation. Yeah, keeping those people around and engaged is so important because they're they're key to your business before your transformation, and they're going to be very key for your business after because you know they learned everything about what goes into this brand new system, and so they they're very valuable pieces to to your organization. Yeah, agreed. Uh, we have another question here, um, and I, 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 you know, I was mentioning that it's for Tim, but I'd love us to take a whack at it too. So, when a transformation becomes a project, what happens to this ever-changing and never normal changes? Uh, hold on, now uh, to, uh, the business world is going through. So, Mitch, you have some uh, some thoughts on when we create when we say we're going to undergo this project. How do you undergo such a long-term project that is going to be in flight while the business norms of the world continue to change? How do you take this snapshot of we're going to go kick off today and then two years from now go live on software that isn't based on an old, uh, on a two-year-old model? How do you help with that? Yeah, you know, I, I'm a big fan of putting together roadmaps and putting together, you know, here's the best of what we know today. And this is informed by our vision of the future. It's informed by our target operating mo model. It's informed by who we want to be when we grow up. And, you know, I think back to, you know, just you know, me as a person, what I wanted to be when I grew up, you're constantly reevaluating those things. Um, ERP consultant was not on the list when I was you know, eight or nine years old. And so as you learn more and you refine, uh, you, you you change what that roadmap looks like and you continue to to alter course, but you keep that roadmap around um, and, it, and it continues to form based on the best information that you have available um, at the time you're making these decisions. So it's impossible to hit a moving target like this, but you, know, you, you do have an idea of what your landscape looks like and what it's going to look like. Um, and if you don't go through that exercise, so that then you are thinking where you will be in the next three, five, 10 years. Um, and it's okay to be wrong. Just continue to refine as you learn more. Yep. Agreed. And as, as you think about that, that process, I'd like to take on um, Liam's question here. Um, you know, are we locking in waste at the very beginning as well? Um, I would, I would say that there are lots of ERP implementations that lock in waste um, every opportunity they have. <laughs> um, what you, what you want to do from a planning perspective, this is where the planning component comes in, is understand that you're creating a plan that is going to change. Um, you know, the, your, your project plan is going to be iterative and it's going to grow. So as you start to plan before you go, you kick off your project, think about those areas of waste that you're trying to reduce intentionally so that you don't lock them into your upfront cost. And then manage the uh, once you have that plan in place for managing waste up front. Go through that project, uh, the project management program, thinking of ways to continue to remove waste. It's um, one of the the key things that's always interesting is um, ERP implementation costs. Uh, that estimate never goes down because um, <laughs> uh, that that money is from a vendor perspective. That money is already counted. Um, that they're already counting on that money and now they're looking to increase that. But from a perspective of a client side of things, you're hoping that that's the top end and that you come in somewhere underneath. And there are ways of doing that from, uh, from a planning perspective and a management perspective. On the planning side, you can work in um, uh, uh, into most contracts, um, incentives to finish uh, um, early and under budget um, with an overperformance naturally. You don't want to... <laughs> You know, we, we want to reward overperformance uh, contractually where we share the gains, right? Um, if you finish a month early and $100,000 under budget, um, we'll split that $100,000 with you and give you 50 of it just for coming in early and under budget. And um, those types of conversations can be written into contracts. And you can start thinking about how you eliminate waste 
by incentivizing the elimination of waste. Um, the other part of it is being deliberate and how you make decisions. Um, there, there are many, many, many times in an implementation where you had to ask the question, are we going to change the software or are we going to change our business processes? Um, for the most part, you should consider every time you ask yourself, are we going to consider soft changing the software as waste um, and and consider changing your business processes as reducing waste? Um, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that when you implement software, you're uh, you're doing that with the purpose of improving your business processes. So the software is there intended to be a waste reduction tactic. And you want to be able to manage that conversation through the the, uh, the implementation itself. Yeah, completely agree with that. Um, you know, we're big fans of, of trying to keep things as out of the box as you can and, and, it, and to change those business processes whenever you can. Um, because, you know, a lot of times organizations just do things the way they've done them because that's the way they were taught. Uh, their predecessor said, this is the way we've done it. This is the way we've always done it. Um, and, and continuing it through a transformation with those types of answers will get you into trouble fast. Um, so taking a look at each process and evaluating, is this the way we should be doing it, um, is a great exercise to make sure that you avoid that waste so that then you have this golden opportunity to optimize your business, your processes, and your technology all at once. Yeah. And, and part of the leadership conversation of an ERP implementation is that there is accountability and responsibility on all parties involved. And there should be many parties involved. It shouldn't just be you and the system integrator. Um, you should have a, an independent third party involved in making sure that um, everything's happening the way that it's supposed to on all fronts. And there are likely to be many other uh, software vendors involved. Nobody ever replaces their entire system with just one system. Um, you know, a lot of software vendors will like will would love to have you believe that, but it is simply not true. And so now you're going to have to integrate with some folks, some ways, and, and being able to do that is an important part of that program management component. Um, on the whole, that's your responsibility as the, uh, as the client to lead your team through that. And as you think about it, um, in, in that way, we're leading us through to the purpose of accomplishing our goals uh, of this digital transformation. Again, it goes back to that, that question from Jerry, where does it start? It starts with the business. Um, and you, you can't not co-op people into, uh, into that with a, with a clean leadership objective. Yeah. And, and, and really that's a great lens to look at things through is, you know, how is my technology best supporting the business? Um, you, you get some folks in it who look at it and they say, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to it. So it must be good for the organization. Um, but if there's no business driver behind why you made these decisions, um, you, you really it's you know, again, going back to that conversation of waste. If you have a very souped up uh, IT environment, but your business doesn't need it or can't be supported by it, it, it was a waste. And that's not the type of transformation you want to go through. Yeah. And as, as you know, the Tammy's question here is well aligned with that in that, you know, that how do we get away from all of these unknowns, um, especially now that we're we're past the uh, past the discovery phase? How does this uh, how can we be effective with the amount of time wasted planning things um, and move into uh, the, the real meat of the work? Um, as we start thinking about leadership and, and plugging gaps, bringing in the business and being and having them be involved in that is really important. And understanding the um, the the nature of the independent consultant who's going to come in and tell you um, these are way more unknowns than you should be experiencing right now. Your system mm -hmm. integrator has got you way, way over your skis on this. You need to take a big step backwards and reevaluate. Your system integrator is not going to tell you that. They're going to want you to think that everything is coming up roses the whole way for as long as possible. Um, and it's that's why an independent third party is so important in this, who can help you understand the difference between when things are hard just because you're implementing software, because there are times where it's like, it's just difficult. It, it's always going to be difficult. And there, that's just, this is part of that difficult experience. Knowing the difference between that and something that's going wrong right now and is hard because it's wrong 
um, is, is really hard to tell the difference, especially when you're in the middle of it and your system integrator is in the middle of it because it's hard for you to see the forest for the trees. They don't have an incentive to call it out, call it like it is. And they probably feel like they can fix it anyway and write this ship. So they're not going to say anything. Having somebody call it out like that and say, look, this isn't hard because it's supposed to be. This is hard because we're off our off the tracks here. Let's figure out how to do that so that when we move forward and we start getting past those validation stages, we don't look back and, and, and then realize at that point that, oh, that was hard because it because we, we screwed it up royally. Um, we, we don't want to be in that position at all. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, and having been on a few projects where we've helped clients to find their way back to the path, and that's what brought us in. Um, one of the best ways you as an internal organization can help with this, you know, outside of bringing in a third party um, independent consultant is, is freeing up your people. Um, there's so many times where part of the plan is not to backfill roles and responsibilities. It is, well, on top of your day job, you're going to do an implementation. Um, and that that doesn't go well because it, it makes it so that then folks are trying to juggle too many things. They make easy decisions because they have a lack of time rather than think through what is the right decision and the right course of action. And so opening your folks up to, to do that critical thinking um, is a huge way that you can take steps internally um, on top of working with a, an independent third party.